Welcome. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I direct the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley, and I'm delighted to see this room with these people on this night. I see a lot of leadership fellows who are graduating. I see the families. I see mentors. I see professors who have helped. I see an amazing array of humanity in here that maybe uh, proves what's on the screen, which is not my particular slide, but it's a system, not a person. It kind of, you all sort of demonstrate, I think, part of the talk that's coming up here later this evening. You know, um, at the Hallenstein Center, we have focused a lot on something we call the Common Ground Initiative. And we have gone to great pains to get our audiences to understand that it has nothing to do with moving towards some mushy middle. It's people, progressives, holding on to their core convictions. It's conservatives holding on to their core convictions. And they sink their roots deep into bedrock in their philosophy and in their history. And that's good. We need that. But we also need people who have an instinct. Think of it as a tree, the roots going down the bedrock. But we also need people with an instinct. And that ecology on top, that garden that we call American democracy and have an instinct for how to live with others and work with others and make good things happen with others. I call it an ecology of politics. And the Common Ground Initiative challenges you to, yes, hang on to your convention, convictions as a progressive, you're conservative, but do something that requires courage and imagination. Build the bridge between the two because that's where the hard work of democracy really takes place in being able to reach out to people that you may disagree with, that you may not even like. But American democracy has to go on. We're in a period a lot of people say we're in a crisis. I'll let you decide whether our crisis is any worse than what we faced in 1860 or 1787. But that's what our focus is and Thank you for being such a good audience over this past year as we've spread that word. Now, in our Wheelhouse Talk series, we typically have three kinds of speakers who come in. We have speakers who have talked about attributes, the attributes of leadership. I think of President Ford. Uh, in one of the last interviews I had with President Ford at Beaver Creek, I said, President Ford, what's it all come down to? What's the leadership challenge? And of course, he's old school, so he goes immediately to the attributes. And he said, trust. Trust, young man. He said, people have to know that the leader is going to do the right thing. And when a leader says he or she is going to do something, that person will deliver. A second kind of speaker we typically have is someone who comes in and tells the great stories of leaderships leadership uh, success. I think of somebody like H.W. Brands. Bill Brands comes back every President's Day. He writes, you know, Pulitzer Prize quality history book every year. And Bill tells the compelling story of a leader who has overcome a lot of tragedy usually and suffering to be the kind of leader that can get something done. But the, out of that tragedy and suffering, it usually comes in incredible capacity for empathy and understanding others. Bill does a great job. Well, tonight we're going to have a third kind of speaker that we don't usually have. Very rare kind of speaker. Tonight we're going to be challenged as an audience to step back from all the metrics of leadership, the social science of leadership that's measurable. We're going to be challenged to step back from the attributes of leaders that are so much the focus, or of the stories of particular leaders, which can be inspiring. But sometimes it's important to step back and look at the culture of leadership. What is the environment in which our leaders are trained? What is the environment in which they go out and try to improve their communities? You know, Socrates in the Agora of ancient Greece asked tough questions of people. 
And we have a speaker tonight who is going to ask tough questions of many of us who carry certain assumptions about leadership because of the way it's typically presented in our culture. So who is this remarkable person who is going to be addressing us tonight? Barbara Kellerman is the James McGregor Burns Lecturer in Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is the founding executive director of the school's Center for Public Leadership. She's been the director of the Center for the Advanced Study of Leadership at the University of Maryland. Barbara received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College and her MA and PhD in political science from Yale. She's been awarded three Fulbrights, which I think is pretty phenomenal. She was the co-founder of the International Leadership Association and is author and editor of many of the books. And in fact, I discovered Barbara Kellerman through my own uh, leadership classrooms where I've used her reader for many years. It's the best out there. And some of her other books include Leadership, Multidisciplinary Perspectives, The Political Presidency, Bad Leadership, Followership, which she will address, Women and Leadership, The End of Leadership, and Hard Times, Leadership in America, which came out in 2014. The End of Leadership was long listed by the Financial Times as among the best business books of 2012 and selected by choice as essential reading. Barbara Kellerman has appeared often on CBS, NBC, the whole alphabet out there of media. She has contributed articles and reviews to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the usual suspects out there, widely accessible. And she speaks to audiences all over the world. In fact, after she leaves us, I believe she's going to Australia, down under. We can't keep her too late tonight. She was ranked by Forbes.com as among the top 50 business thinkers and by leadership excellence in the top 15 of thought leaders in management and leadership. In both 2015 and 2016, she was ranked by global gurus as number 13 on the list of world's top 30 management professionals. And in 2016, she has been given the lifetime, was given the Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Leadership Association. She blogs regularly, in fact, I reviewed some of her latest blog posts and they are really an interesting take on the situation we face today in this country. I urge you to go to her blog post. And uh, in spite of insisting that she would never do so again, she's writing another book about leadership. And this evening she's going to tell us about her work. I think you will find her very provocative and interesting in the best sense of the word. Please welcome Barbara Kellerman. So I really have to be clever and interesting now. That was a great introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, first of all, I want to uh, start by, uh, by congratulating the graduates. Uh, I feel honored to be present on, it's really your evening, your occasion. Congratulations to the graduates. Congratulations to the families. And I appreciate your being willing to listen to me talk about leadership, but not just leadership, as you just heard. This is going to be a sort of global perspective. So hang on to your hats, or the rough equivalent thereof. We are going to do, uh, I guess I would say, the history of leadership since the beginning of time. And we're going to do a look at leadership the world over in 30 minutes. <laughs> hang in there, that's exactly what's going to happen. So I want to start by saying, which is something that I actually said at lunch today, which is that, um, that I am something of a contrarian. And you, just, you got a bit of a hint of that just now when you heard that I am really, really, really interested in leaders and really, really, really interested in leadership, but I am sick and tired of the fixation on the single individual on traits, on hero worship, on great men, great even great women. There are occasionally, we do hear great women, very rarely. Um, so 
the reason I'm sick of it is because it just, first of all, it never made sense. And it certainly doesn't make sense in the second decade of the 21st century. And if I convince you of nothing in the next 30 to 45 minutes, uh, it is that you see leadership, as I said, as a system and not as a person. So I will talk for about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes in thereabouts, and then we're gonna have a back and forth for another 15, 20 minutes that I expect to be collaborate. What is it, common ground? We're gonna have a conversation for the common ground. However, I hope also that it's conflictual, that we have a little bit of argument back and forth so that we engage in a lively fashion. So if you look at the top two words, you're going to see immediately one of the reasons why I am somewhat controversial in my own field, which I call leadership studies or leadership development. And it's because I think of this whole business of teaching people how to lead as, among other things, not exclusively, a money-making proposition, particularly in the private sector. Lots of people, not me, but lots of people, make a lot of money teaching people how to lead. I call it an industry. Let me be very clear. People have been interested in leadership since the beginning of time. Give me one name that goes all the way back of somebody who was interested in leadership a couple of thousand years ago. Anybody? Socrates. Socrates. One more. Alexander. Alexander. Thank you. Plato, Confucius. We can go back. Machiavelli, not a thousand. In other words, people have been interested in leadership since the beginning of time, but the leadership industry including the, the Howenstein Center, including you guys, including where I am. The Center for Public Leadership is only about 40 years old. Do you know that the Harvard Business School has the word leader and leadership in it? Do you know that the Harvard, in its mission statement, do you know that the Harvard Kennedy School has the word leader or leadership in its mission statement? Do you know that the Harvard Ed School has the word leader or leadership in its mission statement? Do you know that the Harvard Dental School has the word leader or leader in its mission statement? The law school, the medical school, we are obsessed with leadership. That's the leadership industry. You can see below some of the assumptions leadership can be taught, leadership can be learned. By the way, not just by, you know, when Plato was teaching leadership, which is what he did, his assumption was we can teach leadership to a very few select members of an elite. Now it's just the opposite. Now we assume that anybody can learn how to lead. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but at least it's an assumption that we could debate. Leadership can be learned quickly and easily. You guys take leadership courses. The Harvard Business School has come for a week, come for a weekend, take a three months course, and you too can learn how to be a leader. Anybody in this room have any idea how old somebody had to be before Plato considered a person a leader? If you don't know, take a guess. 30,000. More. You said it, somebody in here said 50. Oh, did you say it? I don't want to deprive you. Did you say it too? <laughs> a couple of people, 50. In other words, if you want to learn how to be a leader or you wanted to learn how to be a leader in Plato's time, you had to learn year after year after year, none of this weekend stuff, none of this semester stuff, none of this year stuff, years. So you can see how far we have deviated. And my last line, please read it on your own, my last bullet point, I am going to be returning to it. So, how old did I say, this is a test, are you listening to me? <laughs> it's a test, how old did I say the leadership industry was? Oh my God, oh jeez, you weren't kidding, they're good. About 40 years old. Guess what's happened in the 40 years of the leadership industry? How many of you know what has happened? I'll talk about the United States. We could go other places in the world. What's happened to our perception of the president? What's happened to our belief in the Supreme Court? What's happened to our trust in Congress over the same 40-year period? Am I allowed to say down the toilet in, in <laughs> Rand's Rand? Down the toilet. You know 
you know the polls, they're abysmal. So the irony is, as the leadership industry has burgeoned, our faith in leaders, our trust in leaders has declined precipitously. You have to ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? Bad leadership we know is ubiquitous, there are no respectable metrics, and the leadership attribution error prevails and persists. What do I mean by the leadership attribution error? It is our tendency, for various reasons, which I will not go into now, to attribute everything that's good to the leader, to attribute everything that's bad to the leader, and to somehow assume that the other people in the group or the organization are unimportant. There's an old-fashioned word called balderdash. Balderdash. OK, you didn't think I could do this, right? I'm going to do it. <coughs> so I'm going to try to persuade you how we have changed our conception of leadership and followership by taking you through these five bullet points. So I'll give a dollar to anyone. OK, so Machiavelli is easy. What's Machiavelli's big book on leadership? The Prince. The Prince. OK, many of us have read The Prince. I'll give a dollar to anyone who can tell me what Plato called his hero leader. And no faculty are allowed to, no, I'll give a dollar, I don't want to be deprived of a dollar that quickly. Only a student can reply. Any student who knows what Pla how, what, how Plato referred to the ideal leader. What did he think? Are you a student? Yeah, the philosopher Damn. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. I am nothing if not a woman of my word. This is sweet. So this is going to teach me not to do this experiment again. <laughs> Okay, so Plato and Machiavelli, philosopher king and the prince, in other words, the person at the top. By the time we get to Hobbes and Locke, anybody in this room ever read The Leviathan? I don't mean the whole Leviathan. Oh my God, oh geez, so impressive. <laughs> so Hobbes and Locke started doing something really different. They were precursors, precursors of the Enlightenment or wrote about the Enlightenment. Hobbes was the first one to say that other people had a right, not just the prince and not just philosopher kings. They had a right to life. That's what the Leviathan was all about. And Locke and Montesquieu, as you all know, because it's echoed in the Declaration of Independence and in the Founding Fathers, what was Locke's main concern? He suggested the division of powers why would anyone who's writing about good government talk about separating powers? What's the point? What's the worry? Why separate powers? Somebody in here? Tyranny. Tyranny. Too much power in the hands of a single, instead of a prince and a philosopher king, once we get to Hobbes and Locke, and the founders, the American and the French revolutions, we are starting to talk about followers. We're starting to talk, if you don't like the word follower, we're st starting to talk about people other than the leader. Guess what? Other people have rights, not just princes and philosopher kings. That's what the division of powers is all about. And we're seeing it now, by the way. Uh, am I allowed to mention T-R-U-M-P? Is, is that OK? <laughs> So whatever you think about Trump, he has had a hard time with some of the courts. He's had a hard time with some of the press. And occasionally, he's even had a hard time with the Congress. The founders would be very pleased, as would Locke and as would Montesquieu. Others have a say. Car um, <laughs> Karl Marx, anybody in this room willing to admit that you read the Communist Manifesto? 
I love you. Good for you. Good for you. A couple of people. The Communist Manifesto and a woman by the name of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You're going, what did Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, what do they have in common? First of all, the Communist Manifesto came out in 1848, the same year as Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Seneca Falls Convention Declaration of Sentiments. What are they both saying? What did Elizabeth Cady uh, Stanton say? And what did Marx and Engels say? You don't have to be a communist to, to think how powerful it was what they said. What did they have to say? Anybody? I am so not going to tell you. I am so not going to tell you. Elizabeth Cady Stanton said what? Women have rights. Right. This is not just a male world. This is not just, even the founders were thinking in terms of men, white men, I might add. And Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, I'm not going to ask, if this was a European audience and I said, what are the last lines of the Communist Manifesto, everybody would chime in. The last line of the Communist Manifesto is workers of the world unite. In other words, groups that had previously been oppressed were being told, time to claim your voice, whether you're a woman, whether you're black, whether you're a worker, whether you're a colonial, whatever it is. Martin Luther King, Betty Friedan, Nelson Mandela, the same thing. The world the 60s made, and I'm now talking about the 1960s, and what I want you to see is a historical trajectory. What were the socio-political movements of the 60s and 70s? Anybody? Civil rights? Women's rights? Others? OK, this world is not just about women in Africa. Who else? What else came out in the 60s and 70s? Stonewall Riot, anybody ever hear about it? Gay rights. Gay and lesbian rights. Now gay, lesbian, transgender, you name it, rights. Animal rights, the rights of the disadvantaged and the disabled across the board, the 60s and 70s. What you are looking at in a single slide is the devolution of power from leaders to followers or others throughout human history. OK? You pay, did you pay to get in tonight? <laughs> All right. This you're going to read by yourselves because it's too complicated, but this will give you a quick idea. The 21st century, and I mentioned this earlier today, for two large reasons is continuing the trajectory, this trajectory, from leaders to followers, where po power and influence have devolved from the top down, is continuing in the 21st. It's not something that grinds to a halt, we don't think, although I'll have more to say about that later. For these reasons, particularly the two, uh, almost from the bottom, changes in culture and changes in technology, this trend is continuing. Now, when I say changes in the culture, you haven't asked me, but I'm going to tell you. Changes in the culture are very difficult to identify. They do not happen with the ring of a gong, although I sometimes call it the Oprahization of American culture. By that, I mean we have gotten in the habit of letting it all hang out. But when I am asked for a single moment, changes in American culture as it pertains to leadership and followership, I give a two-word answer. The first word is Monica, <laughs> and the second word is Lewinsky. Some of you in this room <coughs> will be or are old enough to remember what kind of a scandal that was. We found out stuff because by, it wasn't yet social media time, but the technology enabled this and the changes in culture to which I referred, we found out stuff about President Clinton, President Bill Clinton's private life that we would have never in a million years earlier have imagined. President Bill Clinton was hardly the first president, not to speak of the first leader, to have a relationship with a woman other than his wife. We know that. But what we found out in 1998 about the details of this relationship changed forever. Once you know that kind of stuff about your leader, it does things not only to your perception of that individual, 
but your sense of entitled, well, I'm en I am entitled to know stuff. I'm entitled to know everything about my leader. And so since then, you have seen leaders toppling in ways that were heretofore unimaginable. Things they got away with in the past, they don't get away with in the present. This kind of stuff that I've just described brings me to what I call the leadership system. I beg of you, stop thinking of leadership only as it relates to the person at the top. And I refer to you too. Do not think of yourself as somehow separated from, distinct from everything else. You are part of a system, it's a very simple system. It has only three parts. Let's say you're a leader. It's really, 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 really simple, but it is extremely important for you to remember the other two parts. Part two, followers. You can use, if you don't like the word others, you can use stakeholders, you can use constituents, you can use simply others, everybody else. How can you understand American politics if you only look at Donald Trump? You have got to look at the American electorate. You've got to look, by the way, at the people who don't vote. Equally important. Contexts. How can you understand, and I'm going to confine my comment to this country, but believe me, it applies to every group and every organization and every nation on the planet. How can you understand leadership in America if you don't understand America? You have got to broaden, if you want to be effective as a leader, if you want to understand, if you don't give a damn about being a leader, but you want to understand it intellectually, you have got to broaden your conception of what leadership consists of. It consists of the leader, it's not to minimize the importance of the leader. It is to say that the leader is not the only thing that matters. Other people matter more than they ever did. They always mattered. By the way, on followers, my standard question, this is, goes back to the beginning of when I was writing about bad leadership to give you an idea of what I mean. So it is said of Adolf Hitler that he killed six million Jews. How many Jews did Adolf Hitler kill? None. How can you understand what happened in Nazi Germany if you only read biographies of Hitler? You have got to understand the German people at that moment in time those who were his acolytes, you need to look more broadly if you want to explain a phenomenon such as genocide. If you want to understand the war in Syria, can you look only at the man at the top? No. You have to look more broadly. Then you begin to understand what's going on. Now, I don't have that much time left, so do you mind if I rip through a couple of slides? Because I don't, you know, it's like a choice. Either I deprive you of some incredibly interesting slides altogether, or I rip through them. How many say I should rip through them? I'm ripping. I'm going to rip. <laughs> very quickly, on, I am very, I wrote a book called Followership. I think maybe uh, uh, Gleaves mentioned it. Take a very quick look at those. If I were queen of the leadership world, which I decidedly am not, I would never teach leadership without teaching followership. I would never teach how to be a good leader without teaching how to be a good follower. I mentioned to Gleaves earlier today, he's really interested in doing some great work on common ground. One of the reasons we can't find common ground is because we always think we have to lead. We're not taught anymore how to compromise, how to collaborate how to work together. I can't lead every, if I want my group to succeed, I need to understand I cannot be a leader every moment. Even if I'm at the person in the position of authority, I need to be prepared to throw aside my mantle of leadership from time to time and go quietly and happily and supportively along with other people. I need to learn how to follow. By the way, in the military, they're starting to teach this. You can't lead without knowing how to follow. Okay, um, one of the problems with the word follower is that it's always sort of aligned with sheep. You can define follower how you want. I defined it this way. The real point is that the other matters. So with bad leadership and with followership, I divided the world into different types. You wanna hear my bad leader types? You want to hear my types of bad leaders? It's not up there. It's like an addition for which I charge $1, but only the gentleman to whom I gave it. 
Um, so my bad leader types are, I divide, since nobody's writing, uh, of, there are a billion books on good leadership, how to be a good leader, blah, blah, blah. there are like three, four, or five on bad leadership. Same thing about a billion books on uh, leadership, only about three, four, or five on followership for reasons that I, strike me as beyond idiotic. Should we chat? <laughs> Uh, so my bad, so I, when I started writing bad leadership, I thought, how am I going to divide the whole universe of bad leaders into like some coherent whole? And I came up with seven bad leader types. Ineffective, um, rigid, intemperate, people who can't control their ap appetites, corrupt, callous, insular, and evil. So they're, they're somewhat along a trajectory. I just want to say a word about the insular leader, which is a sort of really intel interesting intellectual question. If you're a leader of a group or an organization, you're president of the United States, you're the head of a tobacco company, you're the head of an oil company, is your primary responsibility to your immediate constituents, let's say your stockholders, your employees, your own uh, the, the people who are uh, in your own country, or is do you have a responsibility to the greater good? So if you're a leader of an oil company, to what extent are environmental concerns your concerns, or are you mainly concerned about your stockholders and your employees? These are questions that if you're going to be a leader, you are absolutely going to be faced with. Who is your primary constituents? Uh, I did the same thing when it came to followership. I divided them into five different types. And they obviously go from those people who are very isolated and do almost nothing to people who are willing to die for a cause. So bottom line is bad leadership, followership, break it up, <coughs> and you'll have some sense of, of, of what matters. I'm going to go through this <coughs> again very quickly. You think some of this is obvious? Guess what? <laughs> It's not. It's just not, which is kind of sad. OK, context, I'm not going to take you through all this except to say a few overarching points about context of the 21st century. Some of you may have heard of VUCA. It's a kind of acronym for how people now describe the world in which you all are going to be leading. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, Gleaves raised an interesting point. Is the world today that much more complex, that much more uncertain, that much more volatile than it used to be? Hard to measure these things. It feels to us as if change, particularly in the realm of technology, but by no means only. For example, if you're a student of international affairs, change has been fast, rapid. How do I keep track of it? How do I manage it? This kind of stuff is really, really important. So these are some running themes about context in the United States. But I'm going to, um, going to um, I'll leave you with this up here, but not before. I don't care if I have time or not. I've decided to chuck out. You don't mind staying here till 11 or 12 tonight, do you? <laughs> so I am going to uh, close my own comments by reading to you since I'm madly in love with my own writing, <laughs> by reading to you from uh, the blog that I most recently posted, because it's a pretty good commentary on how I feel about what I've tried to convey to you in the last uh, 30 to 40 minutes. It's about change. So the world that we're navigating now is different from the one of 10 years ago, not to speak of the one of 50 years ago. The world you will be navigating in 10 years is different from the one that we're talking about now. And it is particularly about the impact of the change in relations between leaders and followers on the world in which we all live. So this is a kind of global commentary along the lines that I've just indicated. I will read you the blog, and then I will turn to you for questions. The blog is called Followers Too Far. Leadership and followership typically proceed along an historical trajectory. Since they are twinned and since they change over time, they were different in the early 19th and 20th centuries from what they are now, early in the 21st. 
Still, the Western trajectory has remained consistent at least since the Enlightenment. Power and influence, and this is what I just suggested, have devolved away from those at the top and toward those in the middle and at the bottom. In the last few years, however, some have wondered how far and how fast can this devolution go? How much political power can leaders lose and followers gain without inciting instability? A case in point is what's been happening on some of America's most prestigious college campuses. While most Americans support students' right to protest, when such protests turn virulent to the point of being violent, as happened recently in Berkeley, California, the authorities feel obliged, if not obligated, to step in. Authority takes over when inmates overtake the asylum, when followers overwhelm leaders. More than anything else, the rise of the threatening follower at the expense of the threatened leader explains the reemergence of authoritarianism, leadership more dictatorial than democratic. Putin clamped down when Russians got restive. Erdogan clamped down when Turks got defiant. El Sisi clamped down in the wake of the Arab Spring, and Xi Jinping clamped down in response to the growing numbers of Chinese activists. Additionally, are strong men in other countries that previous were liberal and democratic, such as Hungary. Additionally, are would-be strong men, such as Donald Trump. And additionally, is a significant percentage of the electorate, the American electorate, that itself opts for order over disorder, for the illusion of reversion over the encroachment of change, which raises this question. How far will the pendulum swing? Will followers in liberal Western democracies continue to feel unmoored, continue in consequence to revert to populism and authoritarianism, or will the trajectory of history prove immutable and the regression to autocracy more an aberration than a rule? All right, don't get aggressive, don't get hostile. <laughs> uh, okay, those are the end of my formal comments. I've got, I think, at least 10 or 15 minutes for your comments and questions, which I hope is obvious, I welcome. So you're on, guys. Yes? Well, that's off the blog post, I believe. So uh, I think it was the 15th of April. Erdogan in Turkey won his referendum, granting yes. an already authoritarian president more power. Yes. Close to dictatorship. Um, but he won by 51.3%. Yes, um, and, and the election by. may not have been totally fair. Right, and those right. are New York Times yes. stats. Uh, I was wondering well, that's as close to God as we can get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I figured I'd want to cite my sources. So. <laughs> What I was wondering if you could give insight into that it has been a few weeks since this happened is, can you give us more insight into Turkey's followership and why they might have granted an already authoritarian president more power? Yeah. Well, uh, I am not an expert on Turkey, but I read the New York Times. So, you know. um, so uh, look, my understanding is probably every bit, since you asked the question, every bit uh, as yours is. Uh, the the what tur what's happening in Turkey is not, inc the reasons for it are different, of course, but not incredibly different from what's happening in France or incredibly different from what's happening in Britain or incredibly different from what's happening in the United States. We are seeing very serious cleavages. This goes to the common ground point. Very serious cleavages in some of these liberal Western democracies. And in, it's, it relates to all the stuff we've been talking about. Followers feel emboldened and empowered to say their piece. They go protesting and marching and get hysterical and, and feel their voices have to be heard. They feel these passions very strongly. So in Turkey, the standard divide we hear is between secular liberal on the one hand and uh, religious and less liberal, I don't want to say authoritarian, on the other hand. That's a serious divide. 
A serious divide in this country is in a, a, a Republican Congress that can't see, a Republican dominate Congress that can't seem to work very well with the Democrats. In other words, we have, what we've heard now for years is what we see in Washington is a kind of freeze, an inability to work together. What we saw in Britain, contrary to all expectations, is a shudder and a stroke of astonishment when in fact the leavers beat the remainers. Uh, in France, we're witnessing it as we sit here, the tensions between the sort of liberal Democrats and those who are followers of Marine Le Pen, who are, uh, I'm going to be careful about labels here, but some would regard as much more authoritarian and with some fascist tendencies, whatever, whatever. The words that are used are nationalist and populist. This is a trend that is not peculiar to Turkey. Nor is it peculiar to Turkey, as I suggested in my comments, that this, the strong person's solution to the restiveness is, in fact, to clamp down. And it's happened in country after country after country. It, what I'm trying to say is that the clamping down that we have seen in China and Russia and Turkey and Egypt is in response to that trajectory of history that I was showing you. What's happened in Egypt is a response to the Arab Spring. What's happened in Egypt is a response to Syria. These are all inter, these are huge, you know, they play out in our daily lives, but they're also huge grand themes that you guys are gonna be wrestling with. Now I'm gonna take this one step further, and you didn't ask me this question, but I'm sort of big on this theme. You heard me talk about the leadership industry, and you well remember it, it's about 40 years old. What has happened since the rise of the fixation on leadership, impossible to prove what I'm saying, but I'm going to give you my impression nevertheless, is a, greater, a, great, a lesser attention to civics and to collaboration, to use your language, uh, Gleaves, common ground, and more attention to the development of the individual. By the way, Again, you haven't asked me this, but I'm going to volunteer it. It's not unconnected to the way we raise children. We raise children differently in the last 10, 20, 30 years from the way we used to raise them. A lot of attention to the individual needs, wants, and wishes. When you're a leader, you pay attention to my own development. Most of leadership training and development is I need to learn my skills. I need to, I need to, I need to. Some of it is value directed, certainly at the undergraduate level. But in the world at large, I can assure you that most leadership training programs are not directed toward the common good. They're directed for the benefit of my group or my organization or what I want to do, whatever, whatever. So a lot of this stuff is interrelated in ways that are very, very difficult to pinpoint. But I would argue that it is your, you know, I'm talking now to the graduates, the graduates generation's responsibility to perhaps move away a little bit from this fixation on leadership, or at least to combine it with greater civic-mindedness so that we have more of a group mentality as opposed to single individual mentality. A guy named Christopher Lash years ago wrote, wrote a book called, the, he said America was becoming a culture of narcissists. You've heard Trump referred to as a narcissist. In any case, there is a focus on the self as opposed to the common wheel, which is relatively recent. Other questions, comments? Yes. Can you all hear if the person doesn't crawl over other people's laps? And I can project. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Project away. Um, so is there a, uh, you may have a difference, or can you point to a difference between a leader and someone with authority? And then I, as a second part of that, I guess, um, with this rise in more authoritarian, authoritarian um, leadership or governance, yes. um, is that maybe a failure of leadership or ability of people to adapt to a, a, a new type of leadership that is needed? Okay, so I'll take your second uh, question first. Uh, the second question, I think the rise of, it's, I, th I think the rise in authoritarianism recently, I'm not talking about historically, I'm talking about the last five years, is absolutely flat out a rise in the empowerment of the follower. The sense is, unless I shut these people up, I'm going to lose control. And if I don't want to lose control, I have to shut these people up. And that's what you've been seeing in many countries around the world. With regard to your first question, it's one that comes up a lot. And I'll give you the leadership answer, and then I'll give you my answer. 
So the leadership answer is there's a real difference between leadership and authority. So a person who's in a position of authority is holding, as you know, that I always talk about three different kinds of influences. One is power, one is authority, and the other one is influence. So I think of power. Does anybody know what Mao Zedong said about power? Will you say? Perfect. He said, thank you very much, absolutely right, power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Now, none of the leadership literature talks about that kind of power. It's as if that kind of power doesn't exist in the Pollyanna world of the leadership literature world. You can go to your, what's your main bookstore called? Bookstore? <laughs> Campus bookstore, okay, I realize nobody holds books anymore, but like make believe there was a bookstore. Make believe there's a bookstore. Make believe you're going to the shelf that has a lot of leadership books. They are not gonna have this conception of power because they're all about the Pollyanna world of, gee, how am I gonna be a good leader and it's all so wonderful. But in the real world, Mao had it right. Power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And by the way, if I've got a job, and my employer comes up to me and says, I'm so sorry, Barbara, we really do like you, but unfortunately we can't use you anymore. He's not using authority. He's not using influence or she. They're using, their power is over me to get, get, get me out of that position. So power is an incredibly undervalued and under, the, in other words, the capacity to punish or to reward. That's what power is underutilized, under-tested, very important. The next one is authority. So authority, the leadership literature is full of people who make a distinction between authority and leadership. So authority is I'm holding a title or a position and that allows me to, you know, to direct what's happening and so forth and so on. That is often distinguished from a leader who is drawing on his or her own sense of personal influence. My own preference, sorry I don't know your name, my own preference is not to make that distinction. I think it was you who said I read it in the New York Times. I write, I blog, and I write my books as if I was writing for the New York Times. The New York Times does not make a distinction between a good leader and a bad leader. It's somebody who's in a position of authority, they say, the leader of Syria. They're not gonna go, oh well, he's in a position of authority in Syria, but he's not really a leader because he doesn't do good things. So I try to use plain English to me, a leader is someone who's in a position of authority and if they don't exercise leadership, that's the kind of leader they are. So I don't make the distinction, but other people do. Other, no, you're not, excuse me, yes. So earlier in the day you said uh, we're moving from. I can't, are you gonna hold me now to what I said earlier in the day? <laughs> oh my, I hate these kinds of people, right. yes. <laughs> From vertical leadership to more of a horizontal leadership. Yes. And I was hoping you could say more about that. Well, uh, to go back to the distinction among power, authority, and influence, if you go to the leadership literature, you will know that it says the command, which is the vertical uh, style of leadership, that's out the window. You can't anymore. You know, Eisenhower, when he famously said, when he went from being a general to being president, he famously said, gee, in the military, you can say do this and do that, and people would do it. Once you're in civilian life, that doesn't happen anymore. So it used to be that you were a leader and you were taught the so-called command and control style of leadership. Nowadays, you can't do that anymore. There are many, many, many reasons for this, mainly because leaders are, by and large, Certainly in the private sector this holds true. Certainly the president of your university it holds true. They're much more weakly positioned than they used to be. They can't depend so much on authority because people go online and say horrible things and tear them down. They can't use power in the same way because people will say, oh my God, what a brutal authoritarian leader that is. Horrible, horrible. In a country such as ours, I'm now again gonna move it back to the United States, the way you get things done more than it used to be in the past is by influence. By inter, -per it is this business, you've heard the phrases emotional intelligence and interpersonal skills. 
those kind, that skill set is much, much more important than it used to be. And that's because the hierarchies are all flattened. You've heard that. Doesn't mean they're all vertical, but they're, excuse me, all horizontal, but they're surely less vertical than they were. And when hierarchies are more horizontal, you have to kind of bring people in more than you used to because they want to be brought along, because you have persuaded them or influenced them or been ingratiating in a way you didn't have to, uh, you didn't have to be in the past. So it's a somewhat different skill set, and I dare say that the graduates of today either know that intuitively already, or they will find, you will find when you get out into the real world, that it's much less about the vertical, uh, vertical structures that large organizations used to be identified with in the 20th century, and much more about flattened hierarchy for various reasons, once again, technology being very high on the list. So. Yes, I need a woman, can I, some woman please ask a question? I am gonna be so mortified if no female. Thank you so much, thank you. So um, I think in our generation or in the next five years or so, we're probably gonna see the result of, I don't wanna say a stalemate, but right now there's a lot of tension and you have a lot of gun power rulers. So do you have any predictions for what's gonna happen? if the leaders with all this power, maybe through guns or um, through military, is how is that gonna line up with um, the people? So are you talking about uh, in international relations? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Notice how the woman gets up, goes to the mic. This is what we call presence, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you. I do write a lot about women in leadership, by the way. I'm not fixated on it by any means. I write, I write much more about this stuff, but women in leadership is not irrelevant to all the things we're talking about, just saying. Uh, okay, so can I predict the future of the world? Well, uh, let's see now. Uh, uh, look, I have no special crystal ball. As we, uh, as we are here tonight, uh, I, I think I mentioned to one or two of you, uh, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and before I came here, uh, I was in my hotel room for a couple of hours this afternoon, and I, they had a conference call on North Korea. And I thought, okay, you know, I have the time, and I was listening to whatever was being said on North Korea, and some of you who follow this stuff will know that the 100 senators yesterday were taken, I guess, in buses to the, was it to the White House? Where the hell were they taken? They were transported someplace for this special kind of briefing on North Korea, to my amusement. No, none other than Bob Corker came out afterwards and said, he was asked, how was it? And he said, it was fine. <laughs> so it's <was> like, <laughs> okay, nothing, nothing blazingly new here. Um, so I guess the, the best answer to your question is that Mentally stable state actors are not likely to get us into some cataclysmic war. Now, notice I, there was several qualifiers there. <laughs> you have to be, you have to be, you can't be nuts, and you have to be the head of a state. The real concern, the real, con, the, the anxiety that is produced by North Korea is the feeling that it is possible that the leader of North Korea is not sane and sensible and stable, the way we like to think that leaders should be. But the anxiety that probably plagues those who know best about these things more than even North Korea is the so-called non-state actor. So you have heard about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. You can get stuff online now that's scary as hell. You know, the, the, the information that's being, oh, here's how you put together an atom bomb in your garage. You want to put together an atom bomb in your garage? You too can do that. So I would say the chances of us entering some serious cataclysmic encounter, which I think was your question, are the greater if we have leaders who are not reasonably stable, and they are the greater if we are unable adequate, by the, you know, the scary part is it only takes one, okay? So the idea that a non-state actor, some, you know, we have, you know, when, there's only so much the human, we have little pea brains and there's only so much we can accommodate. In recent weeks, we've been dealing with North Korea, we haven't heard a word about ISIS. 
just wait <coughs> in this country till the next terrorist attack. If it's somehow ISIS related, somehow North Korea is going to vanish from the so-called front page. So that sort of non-state actor in tandem with a possibly irrational state actor, and for Americans, I, one of the women on that call that I just referred to, she sounded like an older woman, she said, I live in Seattle. Now, as some of you, if not most of you will know, Seattle is the American city that is most often mentioned as, guess what, it's, a, it's within range or likely to be during Trump's administration. Uh, within range of a North Korean uh, missile that has a bomb on it. Um, and she said, I'm really nervous. And the guy made some kind of a sick joke about maybe you should move. That's not exactly comforting. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I don't have anything incredibly clever to say about this except the non-state actor and, and you, we really need our leaders. And there's a whole literature on the health of leaders, physical health and psychological health. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, I'm not, I, you know, somebody said to me at lunch day, I did, answered a few questions at lunch, somebody said, I'm not sure this is inspiring and sort of making our graduates happy. And I said, you know, it's the world as I see it. What am I gonna do, lie to you and say, it's all gonna be fine? Who knows, who knows? Can somebody, I, I'd like to close with a happy question. Can somebody ask a, a happy, wait a minute, wait a minute, is this gonna be happy making? Yeah. Okay, so it's about women in leadership then, right? It's going to be happy mating. It's going to be about women and leaders. Well, I was wondering and thinking about the idea of maybe when government uh, fails that the nonprofit or private or philanthropy sector picks up. Um, and in thinking about leaders who lead from the bottom up. Yes. Um, and that's how a lot of change and progress happens. Yes. I was wondering if you have like comments on maybe a situation uh, now where there are two sets of leaders with conflicting ideas and how that might uh, translate into a positive future? So great, I, I'm gonna, I don't know what the time is, but I'm gonna end on this because it is a happy question. So I work at an institution uh, which I think was mentioned, the Harvard Kennedy School. Everybody there falls into your category. They all want, you know, at least that's what they say. That's how you get into the Kennedy School. I'm not sure that's what they really think. But they say, I want to change the world. I want to make the world a better place. I want to be a leader from the bottom up. And it's completely great. Look, social entrepreneurship, which is a, I said the leadership industry is 40 years old. Social entrepreneurship, that tag is maybe 10 years old. Anybody here from the business school? It didn't used to exist. Now everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur. So it is exactly what you're saying. People feel the traditional institutions, government, exactly as you said, highest on the list are failing me. They're failing my country. Nobody believes in, in them anymore. I want to make the world a better place and I'm going to do it by myself. Or I'm going to do it in concert with others. People do it all the time and they do it brilliantly and successfully. What's Again, leadership is complicated. So your question actually coexists with yours. They're, they're not, they're, they don't cancel, they're both true. The world is a worrisome place and your question is equally uh, leads to an answer that reminds us it's also a glorious place, full of possibility, full of hope, full of aspiration. But you be fools, you graduates, if you forgot that question if you didn't pay close attention. And I don't want you to be fools. I want you to be aspirational and positive and change the world for the better, but see the world as it is, not as you want it to be. If I can do you any favor, it is to see the world as it really is and not as you want it to be. So um, I, I, will, oh, I will close with one. Uh, does anybody else have a burning question? If not, I'm going to... Okay, uh, all right, I think I'll close anyway, and then I'll take the burning question. <laughs> I wanted to close with, uh, pick up on one other thing you said. The big changes throughout human history almost always come from the bottom up. And they are almost always driven, now I'm gonna give you a minute to think of the answer to my question, by what emotion? What emotion drives really big change? But don't answer until you th to thought about it for a moment. <coughs> Want to give it a shot? I was going to say passion. Passion is really, 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 really close. It's not quite where I want to go. What kind of passion? What is going to mo what is going to drive you to change the world? 
fear, again, close. I would argue, argue maybe anger and not that's my, that's, For the record, that's my answer. I don't know if you all heard her. Ang it is connected to passion. It is connected to fear, rage. The, if you look at all the names that I had up there earlier, not the Plato's and Machiavelli's, but the Elizabeth Cady Stanton's, the Martin Luther King's, the Betty, they are furious. They are driven by rage. If you haven't read Martin Luther King's uh, letter uh, from Birmingham jail recently, and you still think of him as a moderate, read that document, but, well, by the way, one of the great documents in, in the English language. Read that document again. It is furious, and it is threatening. It is saying, you better listen, you white folks, and you better listen, you black folks, because if you're not going to listen, your world will be upended without you being part of that upending. So almost always, big change comes from the bottom up. Social change, big change driven by people who are furious. That's the big change. All the other stuff is small change. OK, the, the last question, I'm sorry, I didn't see the hand raised. Hi. So um, I do agree with the um, Hobbes, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, policy yep. about everybody having equal rights. Yes. And I also agree that leadership can be learned and can be taught. So what would be your own take as regards um, the context? Are leadership born? Are leaders born or are they made? Do you agree that leadership are being born? Leaders are being born? So I'll give you a half an answer. Okay. The great ones are born. All the other ones are made. It's like I, I use it, uh, an analogy at lunch today. You said to me, oh my God, so-and-so is one of the world-class pianists. Was that pianist born that way, or was he made, or she made? To some extent, they're made, because they do learn how to play the piano, and we do learn as we go along how to lead. But if you're really, really great at something, you are born with an innate talent. I do not believe there is a leadership school in the world that can teach leadership greatness, no matter how long. But if it is combined, if leadership learning is combined with an innate sense, sometimes passion, to use your earlier word, doesn't always have to be rage. I said the biggest changes come about because of rage. But, but passion is incredibly important. And if it is accompanied by innate talent and contextual, I didn't have enough time to talk about the importance of contextual awareness, contextual expertise, contextual intelligence, you too can be a great leader. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, and thank you very much. <laughs>